Yeah. Hello, and welcome to My Time, My Life with Trinette Faint. On this season of my podcast, I'll be talking to a variety of people, from creative entrepreneurs to business owners to writers to entertainers and others, about being bold and courageous, overcoming obstacles, and taking risks, all in the name of chasing dreams and building a career. I hope their stories will inspire you on your own journey. Thanks for listening. My guest today is Maria J. Avila, a Pulitzer Prize winning photojournalist based in San Francisco. Originally from Los Angeles, Maria was on Denver's Rocky Mountain News photo staff in 2003 when she was awarded the Pulitzer for Spot News covering the Colorado wildfires. In her 25 plus year career as a photographer and editor, she has specialized in documentary, news, editorial, and food photography. She has been on staff at the San Jose Mercury News, the Detroit Free Press, the San Antonio Express News, and the aforementioned Rocky Mountain News. Maria is a polyglot speaking multiple languages and now documents work performed by government workers in the San Francisco Bay Area. Hi, Maria. How are you Hello. tonight? Long time Thank- to see you. Yes, thank you for joining. I'm really happy to talk to you. Thanks for coming on my podcast. I'm excited and nervous <laughs> having the, the the camera, you know, turned on me. I'm so used to being on the other side, <laughs> shooting and interviewing, and uh, now I feel naked. <laughs> well, you're already an empathetic person, so I can't imagine you now going into your work with more empathy. But uh, <laughs> well, thank you for coming. Let's dive in. So, tell us how and when did you discover photography? Okay, um, my mother had a one ten camera. They were those little flat, oh, like, I box remember those like cameras. Yep, in the nineteen eighties, mm-hmm. and we also had um, a Polaroid which is oh, now the Polaroids. retro Polaroid they sell, the white one with the rainbow stripe on it. Yeah. We had the OG ones from the 70s. And um, I was that nerdy kid that took photos at every single field trip. Mm. I was always the kid with the camera on the field trip, or, you know, or at school. And um, I just loved it. And my mom would uh, pay for my pictures to get developed. And I just, it was just a part of me since I was a kid. Right. Um, Around third grade, the LA Times sent a photographer to my class on Halloween. Mm -hmm. And our teacher had had us drawing pumpkins and I I don't know who the photographer was. And and it's funny because I have a co-worker that, I mean, an old colleague, Ellen Jaskell, who worked at the LA Times. Uh, Mm -hmm. back then and we've always wondered who the photographer was because it's probably somebody she knew that worked there and he put us all against the wall actually I was not in the photo I was watching him work okay Um, he put the most of the kids against the wall and he took a photo and the next day was in the LA Times I got to see it in the morning and it must have been like magic watching him yeah watching him and and, and 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 seeing the photo in the paper the next day, it a little you know light bulb went off, and I I realized this guy gets paid to take photos. Yeah, I like taking photos. <laughs> um, You're like, if he can do it, I can do it. <laughs> exactly. Oh my God, we were raised with like the can do attitude. No, does not exist in my book of you know you could do everything you set your mind to. Um, that's so cool because I was going to ask you like a little later about your confidence, but it sounds like it was just baked into your household. Yeah. So, so I, I always knew I would be a photographer, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, um, I just didn't know maybe what kind of photographer. Yeah. Yeah. You know, um, but I do, but yeah, I, I just knew. I just, I didn't know. Anybody would ask me, you know, I was going to be a photographer. You know, I didn't know how Um, to go about it, but I knew if that guy could have a job doing it, I could have a job doing it. Right. I didn't realize how hard it would be, but. (laughs) (laughs) 
Absolutely. Well, that would, and I'm grateful every day um, yeah. to be able to make a living mm-hmm. and sustain my myself and my household uh, just taking photos and, 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 and having them make a difference in mm-hmm. my community or in the mm-hmm. various communities that I've lived in and the impact a photo has on laws, on um, change, yeah. on you name it, ethnic groups or, you know, anyone that's in need or whatever. Politics. Right. Um, right. It's grand. It's the first thing we see when we look at a magazine, when we look at a newspaper, when you look at a book. You know, I mean, I talk that. about making an impact. You know, you can't make a, a more a greater one than something so visual, like in your face like that. And to know that you took that photo, that your work is spearheading change because of your image. That's really absolutely. powerful. Yeah, absolutely. And it feeds your soul. <laughs> yeah, it does. You know, it makes you feel good. Um, absolutely. Yeah. Seeing it come to life. Um, you kind of answered my next question about what was it about photography that spoke to you to pursue it as a career? Just seeing that guy or seeing his work show up in the paper. I, I have more to say about that, though. Go on. I was a, you wouldn't know it now, <laughs> but I was a very shy kid. I was extremely yeah. shy. You can't shut me up now. But um, I am a very social person, and but it, mm-hmm. it took a lot of, of uh, learning, you know, and growing into my mm-hmm. own skin to, to to get to that point. But as a kid, uh, I was very shy, and uh, having a camera allowed me to see the world through this little box. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Even if it was other kids playing, or we would go whale watching. And you get to see life happening, you know, in front of you. Right. It was fun. And right. that type of photography um, has a name. I didn't know it back then. But it's street photography. I love street yeah. photography. Mm-hmm. I love photographing people take, enjoying life. Yep. I love photographing people enjoying life. And, um, uh, with, you know, through my career, I I, I I'm the person or one of the people who's there in someone's most happiest moments and also maybe the hardest moments of their life. Right. And and I've always been amazed that um, when people are going through their tragedies, Mm -hmm. that they open their doors and have allowed me to tell their story. Yeah. Uh, through well, so pictures many people just want to reporting. be seen and you're the person that helps them be seen and yeah. heard. And a lot of times it's, uh, they just want to vent. Mm. They want to mm. vent. Mm-hmm. And so, uh, when we worked at the Rocky Mountain News, uh, we covered a lot of crime, you know, tons of crime <laughs> yeah. and, you know, disasters and that kind of stuff. And, um, I, uh, Every day, you know, till this day, I'm grateful for everyone in my trajectory who allowed me into their personal life. Mm. And uh, it's got me where I am. And, um, but I hope they got something back from it. And, and, in, uh, you know, through, like I said, we mentioned before, through change or improvements in in you know safety infrastructure community schools or whatever it was we covered or you know um maybe when ha- you know somebody has a family member who's been uh, murdered or something because i covered a lot of that a lot of that yeah um you know being an outlet for the grieving family members uh, to as an outlet, basically using us as an outlet. And when you're in situations like that, how do you separate your 
I guess yourself to walk into these sometimes precarious scenarios mm -hmm. and focus on doing your job. Like you can be there to listen if people want to vent or if they're mm -hmm. upset or something, but your job is to get the photo. How, how do you do that? I guess when I've always treated people and scenarios um, and been respectful of the way I would want to be treated, mm -hmm. you know, but you are there to do your job. Um, say that somebody does not want to speak to you. You're, you know, but you, you have to cover news. Yeah. Um, it takes a lot of experience year after year of being out there and uh, learning how to speak to people. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you have like three seconds before somebody slams the door in your face right <laughs> you know when they don't right. want to talk to you um one of the things I would always tell people you know even if it was it could have been you know either side of the story you know mm -hmm. you know this is an opportunity for you to tell a story about your loved one for you to tell your own story um and you interview them all fairly and um uh you prepare yourself with with you know questions to be asked yeah. cuz every mystery every scenario has a question i mean we right. walk through life and you we all wonder why is this this way right you know and uh why are things why do things happen this way or whatever? And um, you have to be curious mm -hmm. to be able to ask questions. And, um, and is it, yes, you have sensitive demeanor when you talk to folks. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I was going to uh, say, is it ever difficult to extricate yourself from a scene? Like after you've got the shot and, you know, assuming you're on deadlines sometimes and if, if you're if you're the one person that you know whoever you're speaking with has seen and they don't want you to go does that ever happen and how do you navigate you know respectfully well i i was in the habit of of um letting them know that i was you know i had we have a deadline we're going to meet um i will send you um the link to the story uh when we finally had links to stories, because I, <laughs> right. you know, I did start, you know, when not all newspapers had websites. Uh, <laughs> um, so yes, or or mail them a copy of the paper so they could look it over. Yeah. Um, but um, y y you, when you have to meet your deadline, you have to meet your deadline. I mean, exactly. you just have to leave. But you you do it in a in a in a, in a kind way, you know, yeah. you in a respectful way. Right. Um, right. Uh, yes. Sorry. Somebody's tugging. Oh. <laughs> okay. That's so sweet. Okay. Go play. This is Spartacus. Spartacus Maria's cute little doggy <laughs> just made an appearance. Um. But uh, yeah, he wants to be carried. Um. And so much of your role is. You know, not only knowing how to talk to people, but gaining people's trust and, and gaining it very yeah. quickly. And allowing you, when the story happens, uh, that that's over a period of time, for them to continue allowing you in their life. Mm -hmm. You know, um, mm -hmm. that's very special. Yeah. That's very, very special. I mean, you're, you basically allow a total stranger into your life and perhaps the life of your family. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and I think, you know, some people have it and, and some people don't, and you just have to work at it, you know? Yeah. <clears throat> but I do think um, you have to learn how to do that. Um, um, For you yeah, to have happened. been such a shy child growing up pursuing Honestly, I, photography really broke down your own defenses and gave you this vehicle in which to approach people yes you know you can't be shy now <laughs> no <laughs> kind of work. i am i am far from shy now 
Yeah. Um, like I told you, um, I was raised in a household where I can't do this did not exist. Mm -hmm. It just, you know, it just didn't. And I also grew up in a household where, you know, we're working class poor, you know, mm -hmm. and I always knew that education was going to be my way out. Right. Right. Yeah. There was no not going to college. Right. You know, uh, that was not an option. Even if I, you know, had to get in debt to go to college. Um, yeah. Well, as women of color, we get that message pretty early that it, it is education and you got to do what you got to do. Got, in my my, to my father out. used to tell, tell us, you have to go to college. I don't want to see you folding clothes at Kmart. Not that there's anything wrong with folding clothes at Kmart. If they even still exist, I have no idea. They were the <laughs> right. target of our day in Southern California. Um, we had Kmart too. Target. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, um, yeah, that was, it was just, you know, um, my parents, although not perfect, uh, they were very hardworking. Mm -hmm. They're very hardworking. And, um, uh, they did teach us the life skills we needed to, um, not give up. Right. Right. Absolutely. And they're immigrant yeah. parents, you know, they're in, the first in their family to come to this country. Well, for my dad, it was, he was a second, but, um, no, and, and, and failure were not options. And if mm. you fail, you just get back up and it doesn't matter what kind of work you had to do to get to where your main goal was that you, you did get. I grew up in a household, very similar, very much the same. Yeah. Um, tell me, Maria, what is your favorite form of photography? You've done so many street, types. Street photography. Street photography. Hands, yes. hands down, street photography. Yes. I, till this day, I love being a looky loo. <laughs> you know, had I not found photography, I would have been a, a voyeur. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, no, I love street photography. I still love seeing life happen in that little square. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's, it's, um, it's, it, it makes me happy. Yeah. It There's something stopped. about the rawness and the realness of yeah. just shooting things as they are with things not being staged, you know, sometimes properly lit, like the whole thing and just really capturing the moment and making it great. Yeah. Picture. Yes. Um, yeah. as Cartier Brisson would say, you know, it's that, it's that decisive moment that you yeah. capture. Yeah. And, 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 uh, it's life. It's raw. It's unfiltered. Yeah. You know? yeah. And there's beauty in that. Even yeah. if it's just the way a light falls, the light falls on something because we don't have photography without light. Right. Um, or maybe the shape of something or, you know, people enjoying something. It just, mm -hmm. it mm -hmm. just feeds my soul. It just makes me happy to be that where you're that captures it through, yeah. through the lens and and um till this day that is my favorite form of photography i was lucky in that i worked at some of the best photo papers in the country mm -hmm. uh, like the mercury news the detroit free press the san antonio express news and the rocky mountain news i couldn't have asked for anything yeah. better to wear um, our friend Mark Piscotti uh, would describe it as photo nirvana, where they, right. um, where you're allowed to shoot your own projects, come up with your own stories, and they're photo driven, and um, and and and, and the, the the and you hope that the images evoke something in the viewer as they do in you. And uh, well. I can say that when I worked with you all at the Rocky, it was just so inspiring seeing your work. Um, you know, I had gone to photography school in New York and had the same feeling about street photography as you uh, convey when I became exposed to Gary Winogrand's work. Um, and just being around you all was so inspiring. I was doing a lot of um, 
photography for etown.org, those live music shows they would do and shooting musicians was like uh -huh. really awesome for me. I had this opportunity to shoot Mavis Staples and it was just insane. Um, she was so generous on the stage and the way she would turn her head towards uh -huh. the light, you know, stuff. Um, but yeah, you've had, you've been at some really impressive um, publications and um, you have Mickey, Mickey Turner down at USC that teaches now at USC, but she was Prince's photographer wow. for the longest time. And um, like, talk about an awesome like rock photographer career. <sighs> you know, I she's know. photographed everyone. And but hello, hanging out with Prince that's for years. <laughs> I can't even you know? imagine that. <laughs> How awesome is that? You know? Yeah. yeah well, for absolutely. a long time, I wanted to be. A rock and roll photographer, a, be a music ah. photographer, I guess. I guess it's not too late. It's not too late. It's never too late. <laughs> um, what were some of the challenges that you faced early in your career as a photojournalist when you were getting started, and how did you tackle them? Um, I'm going to be absolutely honest. Mm -hmm. I didn't hit a lot of hurdles. I started working my junior year of college. Um, and where'd you go to college? Uh, my, I went to San Francisco State. Okay. I am a product of Pasadena City College and San Francisco State. I had to put myself through school, but like I mm -hmm. said, you go where you could afford and not and giving up and not getting an education was not an option. I wanted something a little bit better than, you know, where I was. And, and yeah, you know, that's it. Grateful to my family for what we did have. Um, so it sounds like you, <laughs> you got started pretty early in your college okay. career. Yeah. Yes, I got started. So my, I had my, uh, my photographer, one of my photography teachers, they worked at the San Jose Mercury News. His mm -hmm. name is Richard Cochi Hernandez, one of the best street photographers in the U.S. till this day. Um, uh, he would follow our work in the school newspaper, and um, he recommended me for an internship they had at the Mercury News. Mm. And it was they had a Spanish language. They had launched a Spanish language newspaper mm -hmm. and it was going to be a three month internship. And I went and I interviewed because you had to interview and they offered me the internship. And, you know, uh, so I speak a few languages. So, you know, Spanish, I grew up speaking Spanish and reading yep. Spanish and writing in Spanish as well. So um, that helped you know, and the photos helped and <laughs> I got that for three months. And then they kept me on for like a year freelancing for the main paper and for El Nuevo Mundo. And, um, my senior year, uh, the head of the department at uh, San Francisco state, Ernest Smith came into the lab one day and tells me, um, I need you I need your portfolio. And I asked mm -hmm. her why. And she's like, I'm going to send it to Detroit. And I, I'm like, I don't want to go to Detroit. She's like, well, I'm not asking you. I am telling you. So <laughs> she sent it off for me to Detroit. And, you know, I had been applying to these other places. I went out and I interviewed for a three month internship. Mm -hmm. I mean, I was still freelancing at the Mercury News. And, um, actually, yeah, there, and, and, and before that, while I was freelancing, <laughs> I still had a job, a full time, I still had a job at this like folk art shop and I w was, uh, archiving for Ed Cashy, the National Geographic photographer. Wow. Uh, who's you based were in busy. New York now. Yeah. Uh, back then he was based here in San Francisco. So, you know fit my assignments between all the other work that I had to do. Um, I went to interview in Detroit and uh, it was for a three month internship. I ended up taking, they brought me in on like a, on a Friday and I had the weekend before my interview started on Monday. Mm -hmm. 
and because you had to interview with several people. Um, I went to Canada. I shot a bunch of street photography. And when I came in on Monday, uh, they asked me what I had done on my weekend. Um, oh, I went to the Second Baptist Church. I'm a Californian. <laughs> I have never seen women and men wearing mink coats. I, we don't do that this here unless you want to paint on you. It was, it was a black, black church. church. Second Baptist yeah. Church is one of the, the churches on the Underground Railroad before ah, you would okay. cross over to, yeah. to Canada. I didn't know. It was just a Baptist church to me, and there was fabulous people dressed in fabulous color and amazing, like, what looked to me to be real for coats. So I peeked my head in, and there was someone sitting and, you know, welcoming people, and they, they invited me in. So I yeah. went in and um, I took photos. They let me take photos. And it was the first time I ever saw, uh, I had never been to a black church. Uh, wow. First time I ever saw somebody a church have, for a first get, time to have been yeah, to. Get the spirit. And I'm like, this woman got up and she's like, when she, yes. whatever she was going through. And then she just plopped over. Everybody just kept praying as if nothing happened. And they left her on the floor. It was just, it was, it was, it was an experience, you know, Yeah, yeah. but I found it exciting and it was a different world That's than where, where mm -hmm. I grew up. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and my family were Catholics in name, you know, uh, right. We're just not you know, super. I mean, your eyes must've been like bugging out of your head. I was thinking, all why that? isn't anybody <laughs> helping her? I wanted to go help her, but nobody was like, everybody was just holding their books up and singing. <laughs> and, um, so I did that as well that weekend. So the, on Monday, I go in and they allowed me to to scan my film. Not, you know, sorry, process my film. They allowed me to process my film. And uh, Victor Vaughn uh, was one of the editors there. He was looking through my film and he's like, oh, this is so awesome, blah, 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 blah. So they ended up offering me a year to, to come in for a year. Um, Amazing. And uh, I did get offered to stay on on, on staff. But a year in Detroit was not. I love Detroit. Love it. Love it. Love it. And I've been that winter. That, um, that winter was like, oh, oh look at California. Winter. Oh, my God. The first winter I cried because I had left San Francisco. And I'm like, oh, my God, what did I do? Blah, blah, blah. And, you know, a Detroit you winter want... is colder than a San Francisco summer winter. Oh, my God. Absolutely. It's like Chicago winter. If you have those strong winds. That cold that you get chap cheeks, you know. I'm aware. Um, I'm from Illinois, <laughs> and I used to go oh to gosh. Yeah. Uh, the Detroit suburbs uh, every year, visiting my great uncle uh -huh. when he was alive. So I'm quite familiar with <laughs> the weather so, patterns there. Yes. So <laughs> had I not gone through the the winter, you know, um, I would have probably said yes. <laughs> but um, I then got a offer from the AP in LA, but I didn't want to work for a wire system, mm -hmm. you know. And um, and then I got my old one of my old editors at the Mercury News uh, had recommended me for a job for working for Hearst at the San, San Antonio Express News in in Central Texas, and uh, ah, that was photo nirvana. It, it, it was great. Mm. It was great. You could do your reporting you could uh find your own stories you could create these photo essays that were just a few pages and i couldn't have asked for anything more do you think the industry is different now do journalists photojournalists at newspapers have the same I, kind of freedom I, you know what i was looking at um at todd heisler's piece today uh, -huh. uh for the New York time Todd worked at the Rocky Mountain News. Mm -hmm. Um uh and he had a piece on Little Caracas. The the, the growth, the development of Little Caracas. I see your little Caracas in the back too. Oh um, there she is. Yeah, Avery. It's Avery. <laughs> Hi Avery. <laughs> oh cuteness. <laughs> cuteness overload. <laughs> um uh so there are still like a few papers that are left. But the industry is uh, dying. And 
than without journalism. We are, we are the eyes and ears of, 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 of the public. Yeah. Um, because the regular uh, person doesn't have the time to take off work, to go to a city council, to right. go to, you know, research about a new law that's going to affect, you know, children's education mm -hmm. or women's rights or um, you name it, you know, or zoning in your area you know, gerrymandering, you know, they don't have that kind of time. Uh, my father used to tell me, and he still tells me till this day that I get paid to be nosy. And to that, I say, yes, I get, I get paid to be nosy. Um, even now in my own, you know, government job, um, being able to put a face with where the money goes, people want to know where does the money go? Um, it's, uh, yeah, we get paid to be nosy so that, you know, other people go to work and, and do their job. But that is our job. Right, right, right. And journalism has been, excuse me, so under attacked in these last few years. Like the industry has just <coughs> decimated. It takes, uh, God bless all you journalists out there. Yeah. And um, I know when doing I left. This, um, such vital yeah. and important work. Yeah. When I left the the last newspaper I was in, um, you know, I, I still do freelance new journalism, but, you know, I had gotten tired of covering tech and taking portraits mm -hmm. and doing that kind of work because I didn't find it as important to society as I did other stories. Yep. I mean, it's important. It is. You know, we need to, we need to know what's happening in tech. But um, long past were the days that you could run large stories or I remember getting a year off just to you know cover North High or you know yeah and high school life or um a you know a you know a year to work on you know what was that other one uh, anyways some disease or whatever um yeah, you just, you don't have that. They don't have the luxury. They don't have the staff that allows you, you know, for one of your staff members to take off that kind of time to work on something. Right, right. Um, and let's give a formal yeah. shout out to the Rocky, by the way, and all of our Ooh, Rocky. former colleagues there. Uh, let's say hi to everyone. Rest in peace, Rocky. Hello, Rocky. Yes. 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 Yeah. And thank you for I still for keep in touch with everyone. All your contributions. For the most part. Yeah, I you know I I am that person that loves to keep in. Before there was uh, uh, Facebook and you know um, Instagram, you know we had email, and before there was email, I would keep in touch with people, writing them letters. Uh, Imagine that, right? Yeah, so it's <laughs> nice to keep. I know, right? Yesterday, I actually had dinner with four of my uh, no three of my former colleagues from the San Jose Mercury News, and that was that's nice. Yeah, these are like family units, you know. You go through so much together when you're on the Absolutely. Staff. Yeah, a lot of times you a lot of times you you're, you know, you're away from your family for the most part. Mm -hmm. You don't know anyone in town and your colleagues uh become your your uh adopted family. Yeah. And yeah. and uh you make the best of it. You know, you're living your life, you're living your adventure, you are doing you're getting paid to tell stories and take photos. And that is amazing. It's and, 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 but the price is that you are away from your family and friends, but you make new friends, you know, exactly. and, yeah. and uh, no one could ever take those experiences away from you. You know, they'll no, go to, no. to, I'll take them to death with me. So, yeah. <laughs> Maria, tell me about some of the risks that you've taken in your career and, how they paid off, assuming that they did. Oh my God. <laughs> when, um, besides oh, staying in Detroit okay, for I've that first winter, <laughs> I'm like, huh? I said, besides staying that? in Detroit for that first winter. <laughs> no, I know. No, no. I love Detroit. I went back in 2018 and spent a month there working. Uh, 
documenting some work for um, uh, a contract. Um, I love Detroit. I love what's become of it. It's like, you know, it must have been something in its heyday, but it's having a, a renaissance. And, and I, it is. I, it I, is. I love it. I love it. The people of Detroit deserve it. Um, you, okay. So some of the most dangerous situations, oh, the risks covering fires. That you've taken. Yeah, the risks. Yeah. Oh, covering fires. You know, I passed, I did pass the wildland firefighter test which uh, not everybody on staff did, but I did. And I was, you know, it was hard. <laughs> um, and uh, you have to run with a 40 pound pack, you know, and anyways, we, anyways, wow. it was, but it was, um, I, uh, yeah, so I did do that. Um, one time, uh, uh, one of the reporters, Hector Gutierrez mm-hmm. and I were covering a story about a serial rapist it, whose um, family came from Southern Colorado mm-hmm. and like the Pueblo area. Um, he had been arrested after the body of, I don't know, I think it was like nine or something. Countless women were found in the house that he rented or used to rent. I don't really recall the story. Anyway, so he was arrested. And so we went down to Southern Colorado to find out who's this person, you know? Yeah. Who, what's his backstory? Uh, Only to find out that his father had been a sheriff in Southern Colorado and had, um, uh, was fired and I believe he did some time because during the period that he was in law enforcement, he had um, raped a, a young lady or several young ladies oh my and um, he was out of jail. He was at their home and we looked him up because you can look everything up. Everything's at the, you know, at your fingertips if you're willing to look for it. Um, and we went out to interview him. And he came out uh, after, you know, finally answering the door and we were on his property and he was armed and he got us both by the neck. And oh, my God. And he was strong. He was a strong character. And Hector was shorter than I. And walked us off his property. And. You know, like, how do you call back and say, hey, this guy threw us off the property? You know, you got to give it a chance. So, you know, I I, I told him, hey, you know, I'm sorry that we're upsetting you. I'm I'm sure you're going through a rough time because God, at the end of the day, you know, it's a father dealing with the issues of his son, regardless of what he did. Um, And and I said, this is a chance for you to tell us uh, the story of your son. Because. As we stand, all we know is that they found, you know, X amount of bodies, you know, at the home he rented and, um, and they're, you know, he's being pegged as a serial killer. I mean, what is his story? What, you know, got him there? And then he broke down crying. I thought he was going to give us a kick in the ass and throw us off the property. Um, and then he just. Like wow. sat down on this walkway and started crying and 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 told us his son's story. I mean, it was scary, you know. Wow. Um. Also, I was in. So that's one of the many stories. That's one of the stories where somebody's gonna slam the door in your face, or hopefully you could get them to tell you their story. And 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 it's in you know. Uh. The law is there to serve justice, but um, it's fair to give people an opportunity to tell their yeah. story of their life. Yeah. You know, and yeah. in this case, this man's kid's story of his life. Yeah. You know, uh, whatever got him to where he was. Uh, wow. Anyways, um, covering Mexico, uh, we we were uh, covering, we were on the chase of a cop killer. Um, 
this man had uh, murdered a police officer. And, and at the time, uh, a lot of Denver police officers would um, work overtime and work mm-hmm. security. And uh, two police officers have had roughed up this young man who was um, a known gang member in LA, but was living in Denver. Mm-hmm. And uh, he didn't take it as well. And uh, he went home and got a gun and came back and shot both officers, killing one of them. Um, uh, and then he was on the run and Fernando Quintero and I were, um, uh, followed him. We followed him from, uh, we were on his trail and we were following him from Denver to Vegas, Vegas to Southern California and then Southern California to Culiacan, Mexico, um, and then from Culiacan, which is like a drug lord haven, mm-hmm. um, to Mexico City when he where uh, after he was arrested in Culiacan. Uh, but being a reporter and covering in that area, it's not the safest thing. And and uh, like, how do you? Th- we these get harassed. Like, what are you doing here? We hear you're looking for someone. Right. And that's where do you when, find like, your strength to just be strong you're enough to get killed? <laughs> I mean, no. it must yeah, just no, be like just... endorphins or, or something. Endorphins. Endorphins. Of, 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 you know, you get, you, you know, it's like you have your mouth to protect you and hopefully get you out of whatever jam you're in. Yeah. Um, and, and these tough guys with like a gun, they're like, you know, we heard you're looking for somebody, blah, 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 blah. I'm like, Thank God I had the guy's photo with me. I'm like, I'm looking for this guy. I'm like, he doesn't look like you or any of the other guys you have in the car. So it has nothing to do with you kind of thing, right? Oh, but what are, what are, why are you here? Blah, 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 blah. I'm like, you know, I'm telling you. I think that's where sometimes like um, your sassy street smarts mm-hmm. <laughs> helps. But it could have gone the other way. Yeah. You yeah. know? And, um, and then Fernando went through something else in Mexico city, uh, cause they ended up separating us. Um, but, um, you know, Mexico is not the easiest place to cover. And, uh, it, it at the time, and if, and it, I believe still has the highest rate for, uh, uh, m- the murder of journalists. So, um, oh. actually when I told my parents, I was going to study photojournalism and journalism the first thing out of their mouth like they were synchronized what you want to get killed what's wrong with you Mm. you know (laughs) but you know well they grew up in a country where that happens to journalists and it's not that common here in the u.s so um but yeah no uh you you just do you need to do your job you're doing your job yeah yeah. And I, I don't think you have the time to think about the situation you're in. Right. You're just thinking about how to get out of it or um, how to find the truth, get how to find the out, truth, how to get your job yeah. done. Yeah. And um, yeah, you, 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 you don't sleep. You, you probably don't sleep later. I'll tell you that much. We were, we <laughs> were in the town of, Oh, we went to uh, that same story. We were in Durango because we also went to Durango because that guy also went to Durango. And we were in this tiny little town. And Fernando had his room. I had my room. And I I couldn't sleep. I couldn't sleep. I don't it was a you. town. And, and Fernando, I, you know, like I remember calling his room. I'm like, I can't sleep. I was too scared. He's like, I can't sleep either. So we literally stayed up the entire night, you know, because yeah. you don't know. Uh, you don't know. You just, just something tells you. You, not just, you just don't know. Yeah. No, you just don't know. And you go on adrenaline and you're awake for yeah. days on adrenaline. You know, you might catch a snooze here and there, but it's you're working on adrenaline. Absolutely. Absolutely. <sighs> Maria, Maria, Maria. Wow. <laughs> I just and have I a couple of government workers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What, what did the work you, what's the work you're doing now? So uh, now I work in trans- transportation 
And I pretty much put a face with where the money goes. You know, uh, millions of dollars are spent on transportation every year. Mm -hmm. And if uh, the public doesn't know where the money's going, you know, everything's questioned. And and, and if you could put a face with that, uh, Mm -hmm. it justifies the expense of mass transit. And, you know, mass transit's great for the environment. Um, and it's, it's a lot cheaper than having a car and paying for insurance and doing all that kind of stuff. Um, I'm an Angelina. I grew up with mass transit, you know, Mm -hmm. and, uh, LA has a great mass transit program, uh, MTA and, uh, and here in the Bay area, we have a great system as well. So that's what I do. And I also find interesting stories, uh, about the people who work at art you know, to tell. So oh, those um, be fascinating. Yeah. Every yeah. you know what? Everyone has a story. And I think this takes me back to that kid yeah. that um mm-hmm. was a voyeur. And and uh, I find people's stories fascinating. Um uh, it's it, it, and I I've, I've been told, you know, so many times, um, oh wow, you must have led a fascinating life, you know? And to me, it's just my life. It's just whatever. But other people, you know, they, I, I love, I love, I, I could sit over uh, and enjoy a cup of coffee or wine and look through somebody's photo album and ask a million questions. Yeah. Because we all have a history, you know? Yeah, we sure do. Um, and yeah, yeah. Amazing. I just have the last couple of questions for you. Tell me oh, what are you what are you reading right now? Okay, um, uh, so right now, uh, Ruth Reichel's uh, food. It's a history of of food through the ages, of taste through the ages. Okay. So I love food anthropology. I love history. I'm a history nerd. I love <laughs> I love watching history documentaries, listening to like um, uh, audiobooks about history. Um, History and science to me are like, are, are my, I, I love them. They're my drug. You're, you're jammy jams. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes. Um, and you know, um, and I love science. Uh, one of the jobs that I did do after I left working as a journalist full time was I moved to Saudi Arabia and I lived there for two years. Wow. And I was the, uh, the head of photography and graphic design at the largest medical research center in the Middle East. Um, and I mean, being able to, I did um, like uh, medical photography mm-hmm. or OR photography and that's science. And, and it, since it was a research center, you got to photograph just amazing stuff. This is science. This is National Geographic in front of you, you know, wow. to be able to see the human body when it's being worked on by another human in an attempt to uh, fix or ease an ailment. I mean, that's just phenomenal to me. That's incredible. What access? Love love science. Huh? What access? Absolutely. Your your little camera box, your little photo box there. Exactly. Has shown you the world. Yeah. Yeah. I'm grateful every day. Knock on wood. Yeah. um, That. You know, I just turned 50. Uh, I'm grateful that I'm still making a living uh, being nosy, as my dad says, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> learning about good. people and yeah. taking photos. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. My last question for you is what piece of music inspires you? Oh, it depends on the mood. Mm-hmm. I think it would it would be it would depend on the mood. Um, hold on. So when you were sitting up all night, you and uh, Hector, is that his name? I forget. Uh, uh, Fernando. Fernando. <laughs> excuse me. Excuse me, Fernando. Were you listening to any music? Do you listen to music in times like that? No, I read. Uh, okay. I read. Yeah. Uh, yeah. No, I would. I read. Um. I, it depends on my mood. My mood dictates what kind of music I listen to. Mm. You know, if it's 
um, yesterday, you know, it was, um, uh, you know, Iggy Pop, you know, Mm -hmm. um, and Tom Petty. No, no, Tom Petty was Sunday. Yeah, no, you know, and um, the other day I spent a whole day listening to old Duran Duran, you know, flashback childhood. Um, And uh, it was like a 1980s station that on Amazon that played like a variety of new wave music, everything from like Blondie to, you know, Pretenders to. uh, Oh, that's fun. Yeah. It was, it was, it was, it was, it was, it was fun. Yeah. No, I, I, I can't say that there's one piece that inspires me. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, I think, uh, my mood dictates the, the, the music and, and then I get into it. And then, you know, if I'm working, then most likely it's something fast. <laughs> yeah. 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 To keep up with this what's is going Manu. on around you. Wait. Hello, Manu. Hello. Maria's other pup. The other pup. Also made an yeah, they, they, they come and they, they scratch at me because they want me to pick them up. <laughs> well, Maria, thank you so much for coming on my podcast. I have so enjoyed talking to you about storytelling oh, and photography you. and all points in between. And well, I'm, I'm glad that you. you have had angels with you throughout your career that have kept you safe in, these, in some of the situations you've been in. Thank you, yeah. thank you, Thank you. This was fun. Yes. All right, folks. Thank you for listening to another episode of My Time, My Life. I will put uh, Maria's link in the show notes where you can see her beautiful photography. And until next time, take care. Bye. My Time, My Life with Trinette Faint is a Floor 51 production.